Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this community gathering introducing DPLA's forthcoming Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection. Thank you for joining us. I hope your colleagues and loved ones are healthy and remain strong in spirit. The Digital Public Library of America is a national platform providing free access to digitized collections from 4,000 libraries, archives, historical societies, and museums. DPLA amplifies the value of libraries and cultural organizations as America's most trusted sources of shared knowledge. I'm Shawnee Moraine, and as community manager, I support the network, its advisory bodies, working groups, and their promotion of DPLA's unique value and engage cultural heritage institutions across the country. The centennial of the 19th Amendment has inspired major national public history projects around women's history. DPLA was awarded funds by Pivotal Ventures, an investment and incubation company created by Melinda Gates to support a collaborative digital collection focused on the roles and experiences of Black women in the women's suffrage movement and more broadly, women's rights, voting rights, and civic activism between the 1850s and 1960s. The materials in this collection will include photographs, correspondence, speeches, event programs, publications, oral histories, and other artifacts. Thank you to Pivotal for supporting this work and our designing the project so that the majority of the funds go to our partners to support new digitization and metadata remediation as part of the new collection. We're especially excited about the Black Women's Suffrage Project and proud to do programming with our community about African American collections and hear directly from our collaborators at the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff Library, Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture in Charleston, Tuskegee University, the, um, and the Amistad Research Center at Tulane University about their collections and how these political records uncover the political activity and live experience of Black women. And now to set the occasion. On this day, 158 years ago in Holly Springs, Mississippi, Ida B. Wells Barnett was born. Heralded as the fearless, outspoken anti-lynching crusader, modern day Deborah, St. Joan, African American historian and great American orator, Wells became the primordial, primordial voice against the lynching of African American men, women and children in 1892 after the March 9th lynching of her dear friend Thomas Moss, a Memphis grocery store owner murdered for listing his goods at competitive prices to the white store across the street. Wells' scathing editorial, published in the May edition of her Memphis newspaper, The Free Speech, which condemned the lynching, was a response to another paper's assertion that the spate of recent lynchings in the South had been triggered by the increasing occurrences of rape perpetrated by Black men upon white women. By capitalizing on the standard racial bias in white journalism to critique and speak, speak out against lynching, Wells positioned herself as an objective dissenting voice by crafting an empirically informed argument against mob violence. Ida used the resources available to her, namely the Chicago Tribune's annual lynching statistics, to challenge the popular no notion that sexual relationships between black men and white, when, white women were strictly non-consensual. This, this controversial suggestion led to a bounty being put on her head and marked Ida's debut as a transnational anti-lynching activist. We are pleased to partner with the University of Chicago Library to feature the Ida B. Wells papers in the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection. The Memphis Diary, Crusade for Justice, and other autobiographical writings are his important historical documents for chronicling the origin of Wells Barnett's anti-lynching crusade and involvement in the women's suffrage movement. These records are additionally remarkable for illustrating a Black woman's defiance against the conventional gender roles assigned to women in the late 19th century. Leading our discussion this afternoon is Allison Robinson, doctoral candidate in American history and American material culture and instructor at the University of Chicago. 
Allison is a graduate of the Winter Third Program in American Material Culture and incoming Smithsonian Institution Predoctoral Fellow at the Archives of American Art and the National Museum of American History as of September 1st. We are extremely appreciative to Stacy Williams, Director of the Center for Digital Scholarship, and Kathleen Feeney, Head of Archives Processing and Digital Access at the University of Chicago, for connecting us to Allison when we asked her about their relationships with scholars who taught with the Wells Barnett Collection. We are especially proud to center our subgrant partner's expertise as subject specialists in this conversation and glean insight into their curatorial choices for this collection. This afternoon, we'll hear from Aisha Hankel, manager of our archi archival services at the Avery Research Center for American History and Culture at the College of Charleston. We'll hear from Christopher Harder, deputy director of the Amistad Research Center, Sarah Tanner, head of the Archives Research Center at the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff Library, and Dana Chandler, University Archivist and Associate Professor, Tuskegee University Archives. Before Allison and our subgrantees begin, some Zoom housekeeping. We ask that you ask your question in the Q&A box in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will monitor the chat and speakers will answer questions at the end. And now Robinson. Allison Robinson. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I want to give a special thanks to Shanae Moraine for inviting me to today's event. Wells stood at a three quarter profile facing away from the camera. With her hair pulled away from her face, she stared into the distance with a solemn expression. Wells wore a high neck dress decorated with lace and a buckle at the collarbone. The dark colored dress featured light colored vertical lines. The seam of the sleeves lay at her natural shoulder joint and the sleeves were tight against her arms. In this 1893 portrait, Wells actively engaged with the gendered, racialized and classed politics of photography. She wore her hair in the conservative updo, common at the turn of the 20th century. An unsmiling expression was similarly popular in photographs in this period. She donned a fashionable dress that used all of the popular trends of the period, including the height of her collar and the tightness of her sleeves. This photo is the material embodiment of the politics of visibility in the late 1800s but its significance extended beyond that. Wells used images of herself to publicize her activism against lynching and racialized terror in the United States. The photo taken just before her speaking tour through England bore a strong resemblance to the engraving on her anti-lynching book that was published only a year before. These images alerted her predominantly white audience that she was familiar with their cultural practices and that she too took part in them. Through visual media, Wells claimed her shared status as a member of the middle class. And as such, she demanded their respect and attention to her cause in return. Today, I will argue that black women have used photography for political ends since its arrival in the United States and that Ida B. Wells is part of this lengthy history. These carefully constructed images archived each step that these women, stretching back to Sojourner Truth, took to ensure that their voices and causes would be amplified. Today, digital history projects, such as the Black Women's Suffrage Portal, allow us to preserve their efforts and contextualize them for a modern audience. As archivists, academics, educators, and individuals, we are on the front lines educating ourselves and the next generation on political action taken by Black women. Thus today, I will also discuss my efforts to teach undergraduate students at the University of Chicago how to research and reconstruct Black political activism through photography. My most recent class used a, pho a photograph from the Ida B. Wells collection at the university to unpack how the material world produced and challenged ideologies of race, class, and gender. 
Now, in 1864, three decades before Wells, Sojourner Truth sat for a famous series of cartes de visite, hand-sized photographs designed to be used as calling cards. This is my absolute favorite photograph to talk about in American history. In any class I teach, I walk my students through the component parts of the photograph as a means of analyzing it. Students always note that Truth sat on an elaborately carved chair in front of a covered table in a drapery seen on the viewer's right. She wore a long-sleeved dress with a white shawl around her shoulders. She wore glasses and a white hat on her head. She held knitting needles in her hand uh, with a ball of yarn on her lap and a book sat on the table. There are also other versions of this photograph in which Truth sits with a bouquet of flowers. These photographs are the quintessential example of using material culture and photography to articulate the politics of class, gender, and race. Truth surrounded herself with all of the objects associated with white uh, middle-class womanhood in portraiture. Holding knitting needles and yarn were common means of signaling feminine domesticity. Flowers and books served a similar purpose when used as props in portraits. Take, for example, this daguerreotype from the 1850s, the earliest form of photography. Sitting next to a book in a portrait signaled literacy. While we do not know about the woman on the right, we do know that Truth was illiterate. However, she was an avid learner who frequently commented on the joys of listening to children read biblical passages. She played on the symbolism of books in portraiture through the inclusion of the one sitting next to her. The use of books as props and photographs continued into the 1860s as shown by both Truth and the woman on the right. Both photographs were actually taken in the same year, 1864. While the technology used to take photographs had changed and improved over the decade, sitters continued to use the same object to capture their identities. However, truth also ma uh, materially resisted practices that defined women through her dress. Her conservative, modest clothes rejected the trends of the era, such as large bell-shaped sleeves and even larger bustles creating voluminous skirts, both of which we can see on the right. Truth challenged her viewers to consider a multifaceted understanding of how race, class, and womanhood could be articulated and performed through the medium of a photograph. Just as Wells would do a generation later, Truth circulated these images as part of her political activism to increase her visibility and raise awareness about her cause. Unlike Wells, Truth sold the images to support herself, enabling her to conduct speaking tours. She summarized the importance of these efforts succinctly on the caption at the bottom of the photograph. I sell the shadow to support the substance. Historians have debated the meaning of the statement for generations. I am in the camp that believes that the photograph, a carefully constructed image, is the shadow that she sold to support the substance, her speeches and talks, pushing for full citizenship and the vote for African American women and men. By putting her slogan at the bottom, Truth also made herself the author and the owner of the photograph. In this era, negatives of the photographs were actually considered the property of the photographer. As you can see on the right, the photographer placed his or her last name as well as the address of the photographic studio on the bottom. In Truth's hands, however, the photograph became her intellectual property. Every part of these photographs was a form of political action from their sitters and their settings to production and distribution. As black women, Truth and Wells made themselves visible to their predominantly white audiences with the objects that their audience would have also used. But they did not just do so for the mere pleasure of having a photograph taken, which was a once in a life opportunity for most people in the 19th century. Instead, Wells and Truth used the photographs as a tool to demand political recognition from others. This photograph is part of the IDB Wells collection at the University of Chicago. The collection includes writings, lectures, and press clippings about Wells' political work campaigning against lynching. It is also filled with examples from her personal life, 
such as correspondence and photographs, giving us a glimpse into her richly layered life. It captures how well used the written word, speeches, and photography to advocate for herself, her loved ones, and her community. With such a powerful and historically important presence, Wells had to form a cornerstone of my most recent class. In January 2020, I began to lead a course entitled Reproducing Race and Gender Through American Material Culture. In it, we read books and articles that argued that the material world has long been a means through which human beings constructed, challenged, and reimagined intangible categories of identity. We analyzed paintings, architecture, and even dolls for how they conceptualized and ordered human bodies along lines of race, gender, and class. When discussing Ida B. Wells, the students also read about photographs of other Black activists who used portraiture for political ends. One such figure was Frederick Douglass, who was the most photographed American of the 19th century. We also discussed photographs collected and curated by W.E.B. Du Bois at the turn of the 20th century. Like Wells and Truth, these political projects undertaken by Douglas and Du Bois countered stereotypes of Black people through their imagery. Using photography as their medium of choice, they presented an alternate narrative of Blackness that resisted the stereotypes of the Mammy, Sambo, and Piccaninny. I wanted my students to know that Wells and Truth did not operate in a vacuum. They're part of a longer, rich history of Black women and men making themselves their communities, and their political grievances known through the lens. When Wells, Truth, Douglas, and others photographed themselves, they publicly controlled their personal and political narratives and made themselves visible in a world that used politics and the law to control them. But I didn't stop there. I gave my students a range of objects from special collections and pushed them to apply their budding knowledge to make their own historical claims. They researched numerous examples of how people use material culture to reinforce or challenge categories of identity in American history. For example, three students studied objects that taught children ideas about white middle-class domesticity. This included handcrafted paper dolls from the 1850s and a children's book about the role of women and girls in the home after World War II. Students also researched objects that resisted and reimagined stereotypes in the United States. Examples included a board game from the 1970s about economic inequality in the US and a poem from the 1880s critiquing anti-Chinese sentiment. My students conducted research on every object, identified the commonalities between their projects, and collaboratively wrote the introductory panel on the website. They even named it themselves. Narratives and counter-narratives, two centuries of race, gender, and class in American material culture. The URL for their work is below. One student focused her research on this photograph of Wells and her family from 1909. Using the techniques that I modeled at the start of my talk today, she carefully analyzed the photograph and its components, the sitters, their dress, their expressions, and the setting. She then anchored her analysis in Wells's longer history of using photography for personal and political ends. She argued that Wells used both group and individual photographs to make herself and her loved ones visible to counter stereotypes about the Black family. I would encourage everyone to take a look at her essay later. I would also push her argument one step further and link it to this photograph, which is also in the Ida B. Wells collection. Taken 17 years earlier, here, Wells, on the viewer's left, stood next to Betty Ross, Betty Moss, pardon me, with her two children, Maureen and Tom Jr. Mrs. Moss was the widow of Wells' dear friend, Tom Moss Sr., a man viciously lynched alongside two of his employees in Memphis in 1892. His death pushed an outraged Wells to write an editorial rebuking the practice of lynching, the double standard of rape charges in the American South when examined along lines of race, and the failure of the Southern justice system to protect the Black community. A mob destroyed her newspaper shortly after its publication. In response, she republished the piece as a pamphlet entitled Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. 
in many ways, the photograph is a complement to Wells's written piece. It, it portrays the family and friends left behind after a lynching. Both women fled Memphis after Moss's murder. Wells relocated to New York while Betsy Moss and her children moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, where the photograph was taken. Wells stood solemnly, leaning her head against a young Maureen. Betty Moss, the child's mother, sat between her two children, one arm wrapped behind Tom Jr. and the other on her lap. The two women wore black, a sign of mourning, while the children wore white, a symbol of hope. As in Wells's later photograph, their dress conforms to the prevailing fashions of the time. You can see the fashion and hairstyle trends shared between these three images. Comparing the two family portraits, we see similar narratives. The black mother at the center of the family, arms wrapped around the children, quite literally holding the family together. All of the family members dressed in the popular fashions of their time, hair carefully arranged, a relatively simple and yet domestic backdrop. Both photographs made the black family visible. Both photographs used cues from the photographic trends in the period to present themselves as members of the middle class. Across time, Wells consistently used photographs to achieve her political ends. Only on the left, we have one about mourning, and on the right, we have another celebrating family. All of these photographs are the result of actions that Wells took to ensure her personal and political visibility. Preserving this work through digital history amplifies her endeavors and engages the next generation in a conversation about the politics of visibility and activism. Wells was one of many black women, both known and unknown to history, who used the camera to construct and control their identity. In an era where black women fought against racialized and gender terror and advocated for their rights as citizens of the United States, these photographs embodied their values, materialized their self-image, and insisted upon their visibility. And as participants in this webinar, we are all part of efforts to preserve and share the histories of their political action today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Now we'll hear from Aisha Heiko. Oh, hold on, there was one question in the chat, um, if you'd like to answer that, uh, Allison. There was a question about, um, are there photos that include Ida B. Wells' husband and any theory as to why or why not? There's also another question about um, photography studios and their play in the selection of props and settings for portrait photography. So Could you address those before we move on? Yeah, of course, I'm happy to. Thank you. So photography studios played a tremendous role in terms of the backdrop in portrait photography. They tend to, tended to offer a range of options. Um, in some of the smaller pictures in my closing slide, there are actually uh, patterns. You can have some photographic studios offer gardens. My favorite photo offered a picture of the uh, capital of the United States in the background. And in many cases, the photographic studios also offered clothing. So the clothing that someone is wearing is not always representative of their own wardrobe. It could be the efforts by the, the photographic studio to give their clients an option to wear clothes that are trendy and um, really just capture how much they are a part of that historical moment. In terms of photographs of Mr. Barnett, uh, I've seen personal photographs of them and their family together. There are actually some at U the University of Chicago, uh, but I've never actually seen um, a formal portrait of them all together. I don't actually have a theory why or why not, but it is a question that I continue to ruminate about in my own work. Um, oh, I hate to admit, I don't actually know how the University of Chicago acquired Ida B. Wells' materials, but I would be happy to look it up and answer that question at the end. So, thanks. Thank you, Allison. Next, we will hear from Aisha Heckel, Manager of Archival Services at the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture at the College of Charleston. Aisha. Okay, great. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. 
Okay, I will keep going unless I hear otherwise. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Allison, for our um, introduction of that. It's really interesting um, talk about images, and I'm happy that a lot of the collections that we'll be working with here at Avery have images as well. And so it's interesting to see how those kind of um, elements kind of transfer over to later images of other African American women. So um, previously um, here at Avery, we received uh, 19, in 2016, 2017, we received a grant from the NHPRC to digitize civil rights collections from the civil rights movement here in South Carolina, particularly looking at Charleston. And through that process, we realized we had a lot more um, items that we could really get through that grant period. And so with this grant, um, you know, appeared and talked with Shawnee about the opportunities, we were like, yes, we can definitely, you know, the collection that could not fit within that other grant would be perfect for this grant because a lot of the collections were about uh, Black women and Black women's clubs. And so it was perfect for Ida B. Wells' birthday because, um, you know, Ida B. Wells was a club woman. And so a lot of our collections relate to club women's activism and work that we will be digitizing as part of our um, participation in this grant. Um, and it's important to talk to you about club women because a lot of times they don't get the acknowledgement that other kind of activism, you know, gets our activist organizations get like SNAP or SCLC. And so kind of highlighting and, for, and putting in the forefront these work um, really is important to us here at Avery. Um, so we are, have selected about 13 collections to be a part of this grant. Um, VHS, um, and cassettes and wild manuscript materials are uh, part of this project. And I mentioned earlier, so the Club Women um, really kind of expands across different uh, women's collections here at Avery and show, show the kind of network that uh, is within women's organizations that you find uh, women working in different areas, but then also towards a central goal um, within politics and getting the full right of citizenship um, here in Charleston in South Carolina. As we know the history of South Carolina um, across the nation, but <laughs> across the South Carolina voter suppression and um, you know voter tax and literacy tests and everything. And so these club women were really on the forefront of encouraging their members to um, combat that and to push against the um, the the, the norms that really prevent them from the barriers basically to prevent them from voting. And so one such organization is the South Carolina Federation of Club Women's Clubs. So that was basically uh, a regional a statewide organization that uh, brought a lot of women's clubs across the state together from Columbia, from Greenville, from Charleston. And so the collections that we have here at Avery um, show how the women from Charleston were involved in leadership at the state level. And so the collections well, we have meeting minutes, the programs, the newsletters, um, ministry of documents, constitutions, and all that, that show how they operated. And so the meeting minutes are really rich information that shows what the conversation was about and what they saw as important to work towards. And so a lot of the activism that they were going for was highlighting women and to uplift women to be active in their um, citizenship. And so they raise money to um, help, you know, orphans, to help unwed mothers, and to, um, and um, orphanage people, people who are sorry, orphans. <laughs> um, and they had speakers that came to the meetings to talk about voting rights and how these women can be involved with pushing the members to be included in we registered to vote. Uh, also, you have the Phyllis Wheatley Literary Society. And so although that was more of a literary and social club, they, uh, it was kind of the whole idea of education and informing people about the 
their rights as individuals and how to actually engage with the conversations within the nations happening. And so even looking at Charleston, um, they were engaged with you know, what's happened in New York, what happened in Chicago, what happened in DC. And so there were acutely aware of the activities happening across the other, other states. So <clears throat> they also raised money to for the YWCA and the NWCP. Uh, and so you see these women's clubs working closely with both white organizations and other black um, black organizations. Other type of collections that we will be digitizing here, Avery, it relates to hospitals um, and nurses. And so you have people working you know, on voting and education, then you have civic and health issues that people uh, were really activating uh, towards. And so one of them was the Cannon Street, sorry, the Cannon um, Hospital here in Charleston, and that trained um, people African-American women to become nurses. And so you see that they were working and advocating um, occupations and to help because um, black people could not go to other hospitals here. And so they were training each other to help each other out. And so you have multifaceted um, ways to, uh, to uplift and to be civically and politically engaged. Um, we also are working with digitizing some audiovisual materials, including oral histories of, uh, of women that were involved with these organizations, as well as um, lectures and conferences that happened here in Charleston that talked about the political and civic activism of, act of African American women, including um, Jessica Simpkins and Ruby Cornwell. And we hope to use these collections um, within our curriculum here at College of Charleston, as well as creating digital exhibits. Um, a lot of the curriculum and the within the idea of society today and racial equality um, and justice oriented uh, that the colleges are going for. Um, there is a lot of interest in women's activism. And so this is going to be a really core component, a lot of different classes that are coming up the next academic year. And so we're excited about possibilities for these collections and items to be included in there. Um, also, we're working with public programming to kind of bring out these histories and stories to the Charleston and general public who anyone wants to come, and while well as doing a digital exhibit on the Country Digital History Initiative website. Uh, the digital items will be accessible on the Low Country Digital Library. Um, and so we digitize other collections that are there, and we will be conducting uh, metadata remediation on some of those previously done collections that need some assistance. Um, and so we're really excited about how possibilities for this um, grant project and um, look forward for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. We have one question from the chat. Uh, how did early South, how early did South Carolina Federation of Women, Colored Women's Clubs get involved in suffrage activities? Did they focus on other uplift activities in the 19th century? Um, so they performed in 1909. Um, so really early on, um, they saw the, the need to kind of come together across the state. And so, and even the Phyllis Wheatley Society that was established in 1916. Um, so right, the Awasala happening. And so you have a lot of different um, coming together. And so they did suffrage, they did um, welfare, um, improvement associations. Um, so they were definitely diverse in terms of their work that they were doing. Thank you, Aisha, for making those connections for us. Next, we'll hear from Christopher Harder, Deputy Director at the Amistad Research Center. Christopher. Hello, everyone. And get things going. So I hope everyone can, can see this slideshow. Um, uh, this, uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to 
talk with everyone today and have this opportunity. Uh, thank you to Shani and the uh, Digital Public Library of America uh, and Pivotal Ventures for this opportunity. Um, this opportunity actually came to Amistad uh, at, at a great time as we were ourselves looking to emphasize our collections related to women in various fields. Uh, Excuse me, Chris, can yes. I want to stop you? We cannot see the slideshow. Have you shared your screen? I did. Let me back up. Nope. Didn't go through. Can everyone see now? Yes, if okay. you set it to present mode, we'll be able to see the full slides. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I was saying, this came as a, a great opportunity, um, a great time at Amistad for us to be able to share our um, collections dealing with uh, women's activism, um, Black feminist thought, um, and similar matters. Um, when we were invited to take part, what we did was cast about in our collections to see um, what would fit in the parameters of this. And given staff time and other projects, what we wanted to do was take a look for a small set, but substantial and comprehensive documents uh, that fit with, within the parameters of this collection and or this project. And what we decided to do was focus on a set of organizational records related to uh, a group called Woman Power Unlimited out of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and these records are housed within the founders, uh, the, paper, the personal papers of the organization's founder, Clarie Collins Harvey. Now, Clarie Collins Harvey is um, uh, someone involved with uh, Mississippi civil rights, um, but someone folks may not be as readily uh, familiar with as say someone like Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, Clarie was one of those individuals who was kind of more in the background, uh, helping to finance and organize um, civil rights activists. She was born in Jackson um, and eventually became the president of the family's uh, businesses, the Collins Funeral Home and the Collins Insurance Company there in Jackson. It actually built these up into multi-million dollar businesses, um, which was a phenomenal accomplishment for an African-American woman in the 40s and 50s in Mississippi. Uh, she also was very active in her church um, and uh, women's clubs. She was president of the Church Women United. And along with her husband, she takes her business acumen, her organizing skills, and her faith and combine these to work with her husband in the area of civil rights uh, in Mississippi. Woman Power Unlimited uh, was probably one of the most concrete examples of her act as activism and founded in 1961. Um, Woman Power Unlimited began um, essentially to aid freedom riders as they were jailed in Mississippi. Um, but they expanded uh, later into voting registration, youth education, and through Clary's partnership or uh, work with um, Women's Strike for Peace, they actually get into the national and international uh, women's peace movement and um, anti-nuclearization activities as well. Um, this is a, a photograph of some of the founding members uh, along with Clary there on the far left. Um, and a lot of these uh, women came from um, already activist uh, organizations. Uh, their particip participation participation in the Mississippi State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. So much like uh, Allison and Aisha were saying, there's this, this uh, connection to the history of the activism of colored women's clubs as well. And so within Clary's papers, we have some of her personal writings of um, her notes uh, about the Freedom Riders while they're in Parchman Prison. Um, writing about the conditions, about their treatments, about their needs. And Woman Power Unlimited began canvassing the local Jackson community, uh, businesses, churches, uh, and other places to begin raising funds to provide supplies to the Freedom Riders. Uh, clothing, blankets, food, books, toothbrushes. Uh, in fact, Clarice, what really got her interested in this is attending um, a um, uh, 
courtroom uh, and seeing some of the freedom writers shivering because uh, a lot of their clothes had been taken away from them. And she says this motherly instinct kicked in to help care for them. Um, but they also served as a communications network to outside contacts. Um, now, members of Woman Power Unlimited were not allowed to meet with the Freedom Riders while they were in jail, um, but working through the lawyers, they were able to help disseminate information uh, through the reports that they were generating. Uh, and then after the Freedom Riders um, would be released from jail, they would often stay in the homes of uh, the, woman, the women from Unlimited. Um, who would also take them to beauty salons, barber shops to help get them cleaned up, provide them a warm shower, um, which they desperately needed. And so within the set of records, um, apart from Clary's personal um, writings are uh, correspondence, meeting notices and agendas and minutes, reports, press releases, uh, but also uh, information about their later collaborations with the Mississippi Summer Project and Voter Education Project as well. They published uh, a regular newsletter, which we have a significant run of, and even self-published this little uh, booklet, Woman Power and the Jackson Movement, which they used to publicize their activities. Taking a look just beyond Jackson, um, uh, Clary was a representative from Woman Power Unlimited with uh, Women's Strike for Peace, um, which was an international uh, women's organization um, on de denuclearization. Um, both shared this ideal of empowering women and their activism. And so through that, we have documentation of Clary attending uh, the World Without a Bomb Conference in 1962 in Ghana. Uh, the Women for Peace Vatican pilgrimage in 1963. And Women's Strike for Peace also attended uh, an international peace rally at The Hague in the Netherlands in the 1964. And although Clary was not able to go because she was preparing, preparing for the Mississippi Summer Project, uh, she sponsored a young Tougaloo student, a sophomore named Dora Wilson, who attended that uh, peace rally uh, in, in Clary's stead. And so um, it's wonderful to take a look at this collection and how it documents from seeing both localized organizing, but also beginning to make these larger connections on a national and international level with African-American women and their activism. Um, little has actually been written on uh, Clary Collins Harvey and Woman Power Unlimited um, in, um, uh, Raymond Arsenault's book on the Freedom Riders, they get a little bit of coverage in there. And actually it wasn't until 2015, and I'll hold this book up to you, Morris's um, wonderful book on uh, Woman Power Unlimited, uh, that we begin seeing uh, scholars kind of take notice of, of what was happening there in Jackson. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to share these and help expand uh, that interest and knowledge of uh, what was happening in Jackson and how are they taking this just beyond the local level. Um, some of the goals of our project, obviously as part of the participation in this is to highlight the role of women in social justice and civil rights activism and to help tell further that story of Woman Power Unlimited and Clary Collins Harvey. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Morris mentions is uh, Clary Collins Harvey comes to the forefront uh, in her book because as she can tell, she was the only one to leave a substantial public record of her personal papers. Um, but the other women who were involved, uh, AME Logan, Thelma Sanders, and others, um, hopefully this will encourage their stories to be told as well, uh, that we can highlight their activism as part of Woman Power Unlimited. Um, and so we very much look forward to uh, taking part in this project and sharing this. Uh, hopefully this will also allow us to include these materials in the Louisiana Digital Library um, and also some of our educational outreach uh, that we're continuing to form here um, and just tell this, this wonderful story of these important women and, and their activism um, and everything that they were doing. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. We're really looking forward to seeing more of Harvey's collection once 
digitization is done and it's available in the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection. There is a question in the chat. Um, can we have the full title and author of the book? Yes, it is T. M. Morris. So her first name is T. I. Y. I. Uh, Woman Power Unlimited and the Black Freedom Struggle in Mississippi. And I'll add that to the chat so that you have it. Wonderful. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Sarah Tanner, head of the Archives Research Center at the Atlanta University Center, Robert W. Woodruff Library, to talk about the collections they'll be digitizing as part of the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection. Sarah? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Shanae. Let's share my screen. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Shani, for the introduction. Um, we are very excited at the Atlanta University Center, Robert W. Woodruff Library, um, to be a part of this project along with other institutions here today. And um, I'm excited to talk about these extremely important collections and the ways we are going to ensure that they are visible and accessible in new ways. Um, I always like to start off just giving a super very brief history of the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff Library because we are a unique institution in that we um, serve four different colleges and universities. Uh, we are the largest um, consortium of historically black colleges and universities in the world. And um, the, the current schools that we serve are Clark Atlanta University, the Interdenominational Theological Center, Morehouse College and Spelman College. The library serves all four of these institutions. This is a very brief, brief background on um, some of the work that the library is doing and some of the collections that the Archives Research Center has. So we came to include a variety of collections in this project when we were approached. And you've already heard from Aisha and Christopher and Allison about the importance of Black women's clubs. And um, our focus is no different. So knowing that history and the schools were founded during Reconstruction, the history and archival collections housed here are rich and deep. They explore topics of higher education, civil rights, performing arts, literature, religion, um, everything from the papers of Martin Luther King Jr. to contemporary artists' work. Um, and these collections represent a breadth and depth of history of over 150 years of collecting and preservation. So I you know, can't possibly explain all that in this short amount of time. Um, and when we were approached to be a participant in this project, we were excited about the opportunity to take time to develop a special focus on the collections, individuals, and activism that has largely been hidden or overlooked in many of the most popular narratives that we hear about um, most of the time. And that is of Black women and their leadership and activism, especially during suffrage and um, Reconstruction and Jim Crow. If you were to do a search for Black women suffragists from the 19th and early 20th century in archival collections held at a lot of different institutions, you might quickly come to the realization that archival collections with the word suffragist in reference to Black women um, are often hidden or difficult to find or part of larger collections. Um, that is not because these collections don't exist. Um, I can't say that strongly enough or that Black women weren't involved in suffrage. I also can't say that strongly enough. Um, in fact, on closer inspection, when you begin researching beyond these most popular collections um, and what you might find in textbooks, what you find in the archival record are women and Black women particularly, beginning with anti-slavery in the U.S., that were not only involved but leading the way in terms of grassroots movements, vocal opposition, and progressive actions toward the end of discrimination. So the Atlanta University Center Archives Research Center is, has a collection of Black history, as I mentioned, that was dating back hundreds of years. And um, when we approached this project, the team at the AUC Archives um, chose collections and materials that demonstrated the war activism work of, that women were doing with a focus on the suffrage and disenfranchisement of voting rights. But you'll notice as I introduce these collections that Black women were doing layered, intersectional, community-driven, and um, largely uh, multi-dimensional work through their Black women's clubs. 
So not only were they focused on just one single issue, oftentimes the women's clubs were simultaneously doing um, fighting for political rights, advocating for temperance, education, prison reform, uh, health care, housing, and better education options as well. And it is here in the Black Women's Club um, clubs, organizations, and institutions that we found the archival records of women's activism, work, leadership, grassroots organizational abilities, and tireless intersectional um, collections that will be included in this project. These collections will not only uh, be included in the grant um, and just be digitized, but we want to really utilize these collections, making them accessible and searchable with our appropriate description in ways that they can be used to further tell and reinforce the work that Black women have done throughout the history of this country through the archival record. So the collections, and we're doing a few more than I've listed on the screen, but in the interest of time, um, I wanted to mention very briefly a few of the collections that we're going to be working with. Um, the first one is the Atlanta Urban League. So this organization was established in 1920 as an affiliate of the National Urban League, specifically created to be a vehicle for addressing economic issues in the Black community. The part of this collection that we're going to be strongly focusing on is um, the section where Grace Towns Hamilton was the executive director of the Atlanta Urban League. So uh, Grace Towns Hamilton was trained as a psychologist. She worked as a social worker, and she also taught at the Atlanta University as, um, a, as an instructor in the social worker program. Um, she became the director of the Atlanta Urban League in 1943. And uh, through her work there, she worked on everything from um, voting rights to better education to housing reform, et cetera. And I think the unique thing about this collection and what we're hopefully gonna be able to demonstrate through the digitization is the work that was required on all levels through multiple organizations that Grace Towns Hamilton was able to do. So everything from funding to political advocacy to community work, this gives a background on how that work was accomplished. After her time with the Atlanta Urban League, we are also going to work on digitizing some of the personal papers of Grace Towns Hamilton. Um, she was the first African-American woman elected to the Georgia General Assembly. And um, we're gonna be focusing especially on her reapportionment, reapportionment of the state of Georgia to ensure that representation um, mirrored the communities that they were in as well. She also worked extensively on abortion rights bills in Georgia. Um, the next collection is the Neighborhood Union, founded by Virginia Burntope in 1908. So this collection is a great example of all the things that you've heard today about Black women's clubs and organizations. So this quickly became one of the most vocal supporters of Black communities in Atlanta prior to the 1960s right, civil rights movement. And I wanted to touch on this because um, as we mentioned before, so this particular organization founded in 1908 was founded by a group of eight women. And they came together and everything from the charter to their original meeting minutes are in this collection. So this gives you an idea about how um, this group of women came together, decided what they were gonna focus on, how they were going to be funded, um, what communications and partnerships they needed to create in order to make this work effective and get done. So everything from petitions to hire more black policemen in the city of Atlanta in the early 1900s, to leading census workshops, to developing a program for World War I orphans, um, all of the background information on working with city leaders, working with different groups, finding appropriate funding, and all of that is incorporated in this collection. There's also the League of Women Voters. So this is a um, bipartisan interracial group that was part, um, often part of larger um, social and civil rights organizations, including the Voter Education Project and the Southern Regional Council. And this was focused on the education for women voting. So they created pamphlets, flyers, workshops, those sorts of things to make sure that women all over the country were um, educated, especially Black women were educated on how to vote, what they needed to vote, how to bypass um, some of the more restrictive measures that came along with going physically to vote. And then of course the National Council of Negro Women. So this collection, the parts of this collection that we are digitizing come from the Johnson Publishing Company collection files. And these focus on early press releases, correspondences from Mary McLeod Bethune, and so on. Um, 
to uh, really highlight again the founding of this work, how they communicated with the public and the press and how they were represented in the press while they were doing their work. Um, so these are all pieces of a larger story that hopefully, and like I said, we're so um, excited to be part of the DPLA project because these are the pieces that are hopefully going to tie in to really make a more cohesive narrative to the work that Black women were doing in terms of civil rights and suffrage prior to some of the more well-known 1960s civil rights movement era. Um, we plan on making these collections, not, like I said, not only just accessible um, to digitize and have these files sitting around on our computer servers, um, but we want to make sure that they are used, engaged with, searchable, um, that they provide an opportunity for researchers, students, faculty, and communities all over the world to um, be aware of and interact with. So we're going to include them not only in DPLA, but on our own digital repository site. Um, we also are going to be using interactive digital scholarships and, hum and digital humanities projects, digital exhibits, and of course, including them further as we develop curriculum as well. So thank you again for being a part of this project. And we're happy and looking forward to um, the cohesiveness that this will bring to the subject. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next, I'd like to present our last speaker, our final speaker, who is Dana Chandler from the uh, Tuskegee University Archives, where he is the university archivist and associate professor. And we're especially pleased to work with uh, Tuskegee because DPLA does not currently have a hub network in um, for that rep that in that, in, that includes a pathway for Alabama institutions to participate. So we're really happy to make this partnership and explore how this collaboration can be the first of many to ensure that Alabama collections are represented in DPLA. Dana? I'm glad to have this opportunity to um, work with DPLA and with Shawnee. And, and this is a really interesting project in so many levels. We want to show you, oh, well, I did, I did exactly what I wasn't supposed to do. Excuse me just a second. You can't see what I can see. Um, share screen. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, good. So yeah, the opportunity to work on this project, we are very excited about it. And uh, we were aware that we are breaking new ground here in Alabama with the uh, tie-in with DPLA. And we're looking very forward to that opportunity. Um, the project that we are working with is the Historic Legacy of Women at Tuskegee University. And I had to pick just a few of the collections Women at Tuskegee have played such an important role uh, from its inception, July 4th, 1881. Olivia Davidson Washington, the second wife of Booker T. Washington, once noted that African-American girls were the hope of the race. And I think that Booker T. Washington took that idea, that concept, much further. Tuskegee University started off as a co-ed school for students, but also, now this is where it gets interesting, women taught males and females in the classroom. That's amazing. Now, I could have chosen a lot of photographs, but this is one of my favorite ones because it highlights the um, effect of that. And this is a music class. And uh, the instructor is female and the two young girls are up on the blackboard working out their um, projects. You can see the young men in their uniforms sitting in the desks. Um, why Tuskegee University Archives? Our archives officially began in 1908, but started collecting in the late 1800s. Our archival collections cover the entire per period from our beginnings in 1881 to today. It includes many important documents from the late 1700s and early 1800s, which were 
not part of its organizational history, but were indicative of the processes that were in place leading to its formation. We have 600 historically significant collections in our archives. Key phrase, historically significant. With over 250,000 images, and that is growing on a monthly basis. We have literally thousands of audio tapes and several hundred videotapes, not counting VHS and hi eights, etc. The collection of all this material is due to the diligent efforts of a handful of concerned Tuskegee employees who sought out pertinent items for preservation and or protection. The work to be done under this grant to digitize the women's Tuskegee Women's Club Journal, which includes the origins of the organization in 1895 through 1921. Did you just digitize select items located in the library's special collections, which includes a variety of pamphlets uh, and other documents not available to the public. The finished processing and digitizing the Jesse Guzman collection and the migrate photographs of P.H. Polk, A.P. Badeau, and C.M. Batty of women from a variety of economic and social levels, including those involved in civil rights related events. My intention also is to look into our visitors uh, journal that they had to sign when they came to visit. And you'll notice this is highlighting John Philip Sousa, the first bar of the Stars and Stripes Forever. We have many such signatures in that document and it covers from the beginning of the school to 1935. And it's amazing to see what people wrote as they entered in and visited at Tuskegee. So let me explain what we're working on, the Tuskegee Women's Club Journal. I have been waiting for years for this opportunity, and now it's here. Started by Booker T. Washington's third wife, Margaret Murray Washington, Mrs. Booker T. Washington. The journal is full of information regarding how women at Tuskegee felt about art, music, literature, and politics. Now, it's hard to see on this photograph right here, but here they have outlined some of the things that they were talking about on July, on January 14th of 1900. They talk about the war. They talk about uh, the Civil War. They talk about World War I. They talk about all kinds of, of, of historical events that were happening and the suffrage movement. It consists of a single volume of over 400 handwritten pages. Our special collections is amazing. In 1999, a separate rare books room was established in our library. It houses titles with publication dates in the 19th century, particularly those dealing with the institution of slavery and early African-American literature, books published before the 1900s, books published in limited editions, first editions, and autographed books. The collection also contains a sizable collection of abolitionist literature and a large collection of pamphlets dealing primarily with racial issues. Those are very interesting and we've sought for a long time to put some of those out there and make them available as well. The Jesse Guzman collection, she's one of my heroes, straight up. She was an active organizer in the civil rights movement and served as assistant secretary of the Southern Conference Educational Fund. But more than that, she was the third archivist at Tuskegee University. Then it was called the Department of Records and Research, started by Monroe Work, the author of the Negro Yearbook from 1912 to 1943, after which Jesse Guzman was the editor of that particular document. Her book, Crusade for Civic Democracy, the story of the Civ Tuskegee Civic Association, 1941 to 1970, um, provides an in-depth look at civil rights work in Tuskegee. We have her notes for that. An amazing woman. This is a woman who, with B.B. Walcott, traveled throughout the middle part of the United States of America, tracing the footsteps of, of George Washington Carver by themselves in the early 1950s. It's amazing what they were able to accomplish. Finally, we'll be uh, 
migrating some of our photographs that we've already digitized from the PH Polk, AP Badeau, and CM Batty collections over onto our uh, public server. Uh, many of their photographs have been published over the years, but there are many more that have not been published. Of course, many of you recognize the boss here. I, I love this image. It's one of my favorites. But you'll also notice the pristine condition because it's taken from the actual negative. Their photos have been digitized, but have not been made available publicly. Uh, to migrate those, it's going to take a few days. Actually, it's going to take a summertime. But I think we can do it. And specifically, we're concerned about the metadata getting it right. The work here at Tuskegee is important on so many levels with the collections being as huge as they are. I It took a while for me to um, coalesce it into a smaller grouping so that we could provide it uh, uh, an effective um, grouping for, to meet the requirements of the grant. Thank you. Uh-oh, can't hear. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Dana. Um, thank you to Dana and to all of our incredible speakers. Uh, this peek into the collections chosen for the Black women's suffrage reveals strategic organizing, fundraising, early entrepreneurship, interracial collaboration, and the interrogation of class, race, and gender, gender that informed Black women's quest for personal and political visibility throughout history. There were a few questions about when the collections would be available for research. Uh, partners will be digitizing these collections and they'll be made available on the Black Women's Suffrage site through May 2021. We will share details once the site is live later, in the, later on this summer and send regular updates about when collections will be digitized. And we all know the two uh, closures and COVID-19 that our timelines around work and deliverables has changed uh, quite a lot. So we'll be sure to update you all as collections become available. There are a number of really great questions in our chat. The first um, is directed to, to Sarah. Was an organization like the Neighborhood Union open to male membership? Did it overlap with an existing Black Women's Club? Um, the male membership is a good question. So there weren't any, te the technically weren't any male members. I'm not going to use the word that they were barred from membership because I'm not sure that it states that in the charter exactly. Um, but we'll digitize the charter and it'll be up. Uh, but they did partner very closely with a lot of organizations in Atlanta. Virginia Hope worked um, a lot with her husband, John Hope, who was the president of both Morehouse College and Atlanta University. They also worked together to start um, subsidized housing projects in Atlanta. So. Um, there's a, there is a lot of overlap between this work, the Neighborhood Union, the League of Women Voters, and um, the Atlanta Urban League. And you'll find traces of each of these individual organizations mixed in these other collections. So this is, it's one of the reasons we chose the collections we did, um, is because they speak to each other. So you'll find traces of all these individuals, especially these women, working on multiple projects at the same time and communicating with each other throughout the city, especially. Thank you. We also have a question for Aisha. Have you reviewed local descriptive practices to include conscious editing, specifically when describing individual items? Do you have any recommendation or tools? And this question can also be opened up to other, uh, other partners. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned the NHPRC grant that was kind of like the MPLP <laughs> version of digitization of just kind of get things out there um, and that the subject headings are kind of mass um, copied over and over for each um, item. And so there wasn't necessarily time to do specific um, 
item level description for, ev for everything. And so what part of the metadata remediation project is to kind of go back and pull out those names um, that are kind of bit, um, buried within the media minutes or within the programs to kind of highlight those local names. Um, we do realize that a lot of the people that we will find in the collection do not have L LCSH subject headings. And so we will be creating you know, local headings so that they can find them in there um, or use a keyword search to kind of um, facilitate that access. Because um, a lot of the, the meeting minutes are handwritten. And so that is a challenge with students, working with students who don't necessarily want to read cursive handwriting. Um, and so some of the handwriting is really well done and other ones are kind of more like chicken scratch. <laughs> um, and so it will, um, you know, through like myself and the other workers who'll be working on this project um, to kind of interpret the handwriting, to kind of pull out those keywords, those phrases, those names, so that we can really have a, a deeper understanding of the work that they were doing. And for tools, uh, probably using Excel, um, Open or Fine, and as kind of our, you know, fine tuning of those um, subject headings and things. Does anyone else want to jump in on that question? There's another question in the chat uh, around workflow and everyone's status right now. Uh, have any of your libraries reopened or are you all still closed and how is that affecting your plans for, for the workflow and digitization? Well, I, I can certainly um, uh, briefly talk about Amistad. Um, we actually have reopened. Um, we're in an um, interesting situation. Although we're an independent archive, we're housed on the campus of Tulane University. So we, when we were considering our reopening, we were looking not only at CDC guidelines, state guidelines, uh, New Orleans, but also uh, the university. Um, we have reopened to the public, but in a uh, very limited format. We've gone to um, appointment only, a uh, very limited number of researchers, but we're at the same time real try, really trying to stress to researchers um, how can we help them from a distance, e either through reproductions, um, digitization, and, and things like that. But we've been open for about two weeks now, um, and we've, we've had a set steady stream of researchers are requiring to wear masks uh, and gloves. Um, and it, it took quite a lot uh, for us to consider coming back in terms of not only what our policies were gonna be, but also the, the physical layout of the center. We had to uh, move around a lot of furniture, um, take care, um, but our, our staff is back. We're, we're playing catch up on a lot of projects that were uh, put on hold, um, but new projects like this, we were able to, um, um, through some of the planning that we were able to do while we were working remotely, be able to kind of come back in and, and hit the ground running on this. So we're looking forward to, to start starting the digitization project with uh, uh, Clarice Collins Harvey uh, materials here very soon. At the AUC, we have some limited staff in the building, so we are not open to the public yet, um, but we're working on creating procedures and things for that. Um, but we do have some staff in the building. So as Christopher mentioned, we're kind of ready to get started um, as soon as we put everything in place to make sure our staff and um, researchers will, will be safe when they enter back in. Um, yeah, we are currently similar um, staff on the remote virtual services. Um, as part of the grant, we will be outsourcing our digitization of our audiovisual materials. And so our, uh, because of like mail services and everything has been a little bit um, complicated. <laughs> we haven't been able to ship any of those off, um, but we hope to in the next you know, few months have more clarif clarification about what that looks like for outsourcing our um, AV materials. At T Tuskegee University, we have been open the entire time uh, with a staggered shift. Uh, we've been answering emails and the like, uh, maintaining social distancing, of course. We've had no visitors in. Um, 
we've had several requests, but I anticipate us being uh, somewhat open in the fall um, as school starts back and allowing uh, limited visitations by um, request. And um, we will stagger those also as well. But uh, like the rest of the university right now and everybody else, we're dealing with uh, trying to find our way through this, as Sarah said, and um, come up with the right answer so that everybody can be safe. Um, sorry, I don't answer the question that's in the Q&A. Go ahead. Okay. Um, someone um, asked a question about crowdsourcing materials. Um, that NHPRC grant, that was one of the um, items we wanted to do um, for this grant is not written into the grant so that, but part of the outreach activities are probably will help be some of the, especially the photographs. Um, <laughs> when you look in our digital archive, um, they do find a lot of just group shots of people. And as we know as archivists, not everything, not everyone is identified um, in the images and even the location. So one of our donors um, was looking through the online archive and they're like, oh, we know where that was, we know where that was. So you're really looking to um, donors um, and other people to help identifying people and places will be helpful with the photographs as well as some of the handwritten types. And crowdsourcing here is something um, that we've been exploring uh, more and more at Amistad. Um, a lot of it is focused on our oral histories um, and receiving assistance in the content analysis and, and trans transcriptions of those. Um, so it's something we're looking at in, into the future, but we don't currently have anything in place. Um, but really um, interested in working with scholars, but also as someone said, um, uh, teachers, students, um, receiving their assistance in projects um, similar to this. I'm going through the chat to ensure that we don't have any other questions. Oh, there's a question about um, uh, the webinar. There, it will be available. That we'll send out a link of the recording of the webinar um, after Zoom makes that available. And as attendees, you all will get an email um, that gives you a direct link to this. So to, to, to close us out, uh, what Dana last last shared about um, being flexible and learning and, and doing the work well. Uh, as part of our work on the Black Women's Suffrage Collection, we did clean up for the query, which is the long, um, long block of, of names, people, places, and years that inform how we search uh, dig the Digital Public Library's collection for collections to come into the separate site. And Throughout that work, we thought about a process for approval of a harmful language disclaimer for topical collections like the Black women's suffrage and our larger network, um, recognizing that some of the material that may come up in the collection might be difficult for, for users to, um, to interact with. As part of what we call the noise cancellation party, DPLA staff dedicated time to gather together to search and collect subject terms and keywords related to Black women's suffrage from looking through the results to further winnow the relevance of these results. We developed a methodology for distinguishing content about the people we wanted to include, and we are planning a follow-up webinar to this one about race, curation, and collections. We want, we, should, we want to share what we learned in building the Black Women's Suffrage Collection and spy, spotlight the harmful content statement that has emerged from our metadata working group. Continuing this ethic of care, we've also enlisted the assistance of a designer who's also a Black woman to work on the site's identity design and the functionality of some of the interior pages so that it's user friendly. The timeline she gave us puts us at the end of August for a launch of the new and improved site where you'll see um, some of the collections that we already have digitized as a part of that. And we'll announce additional details about the collection soon. 
Thank you again to our speakers, Allison, Aisha, Dana, Chris, and Sarah, and to all of you for joining us. Ida B. Wells campaigned against the lynching of African American men, locate her in history as one of the first women to profess Black feminist theory. And that is what this entire collection is about. Uh, in celebration and commemoration of her birthday, let us spend the rest of the day thinking about the activism that's been uncovered in her work and carry her words with us that the right way, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them and let us all be a light for the rest of our days. Have a great afternoon and thank you again for attending. <laughs>